This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. Recently commemorating the first yard site of uh, the Paisei Kadar, Rav Shlomo Yosef El Yashiv. Rav Yosef Shalom El Yashiv. And many people are, uh, certainly have heard of Rebel Yashiv and may have heard many stories about him, but may not have an insight into the halachic process that Rebel Yashiv used to, uh, to decipher and to come to the correct halachic conclusion. Now, for anybody to say they have any insight into what Rebel Yashiv's process was would be uh, a little presumptuous. But nevertheless, we, we would like to examine a number of tshuvas from Rebbe Yashiv and perhaps get an inkling into the thought process, just a little bit of the way Rebbe Yashiv would, would uh, look at certain contemporary issues. And perhaps this will shed light on a very confusing and uh, misquoted concept, and that is the concept of Das Taira. You know, often you hear... Is this, this is mutter, or is it asur? Well, really, it's mutter, but it's not within the realm of das, taira. What exactly does that mean? So the first shayla that we're going to uh, look into this evening is in the Koivetz Chuvas of Rabbi Yashiv. It's in Krach Aleph, the first volume. Simen Yud Ches. And Rabbi Yashiv received a letter on the 13th day of Sivan, Tav Shin Memhe, 1985. Okay? Who is writing to Rabbi Yashiv? None other than the Kalava Rebbe. Kalvareva. Kalvareva was a Holocaust survivor. The, uh, those Kedoshim who perished in the Shoah, that was something that was very dear and uh, something that weighed very heavily on the heart of the Kalvareva. He was always thinking about the Kedoshim. He was, so to speak, occupied. His mind was constantly occupied thinking about the six million that perished on Kedosh Hashem. And he therefore wanted to implement the following takana, the following enactment. The Kalvareva suggested that every single day after davening, upon the conclusion of Aleinu Shabbayach, every Jew should recite Shema Yisrael Hashem Elekeinu Hashem Echad. For what purpose? To recall the six million that perished al Kiddush Hashem, to think about all those Jews that died saying Shema on their lips, and this way, says the Kalva Rebbe, we would be miyached. We would be miyached with the Kedoshim. We would unify with the Kedoshim. We would show solidarity to the Kedoshim. This way, we would be ba'achtos with those Jews who were martyred al Kedosh Hashem. We're all together. You say the Shema Yisrael, you say Hashem Echad, and you unify with the six million. And he asked Rebbe Yashiv, you know, what do you think about that? Do you think it's a good idea? What a beautiful idea! So Rebbe Yashiv begins his tshuva by saying that I got your letter and I see your suggestion and you are certainly somebody who this Indian is very dear to and you have no respite, you have no tranquility, you're constantly haunted, so to speak, by the images of the six million and for you to be Mesiach Das, for you to stop thinking about it is impossible. However, says Rebbe Yosha, I want you to know that after the Shoah, after the Holocaust, many people wanted to enact a new calendar date to make a Yom HaShoah, to make a date on the calendar that everybody should fast on a certain day in commemoration of the six million that died. And this issue was brought to the Chazoy By the way, it was brought to the Briskarov, it was brought to Rav Moshe Feinstein, and unanimously, and specifically the Chazoy enunciated it, that our generation is a generation that shtika toivloi. We should keep our mouths closed. What does that mean, we should keep our mouths closed? We are not authorized to make any innovations. We cannot make any calendar dates. You can't make any fast days. You can't make any new tefillahs. You can't do anything. Says the Chalinish, for us to dare tamper with a tefillah, with a calendar, that shows tremendous arrogance, as if to say, we're on par with the Rishonim, with the Achroinim, with all the Gedolim who were able to arrange the way we have Judaism today. So for us to, you know, so you'll say, okay, we won't fast. We'll just mark it as a sad day on the calendar, right? You'll mark on the calendar a big, uh, you write on, on that date, you make a circle with two, two eyes and a frown, right? You can't do that. We have no authorization to tamper with the calendar. 
That's the first thing the Chazoner said. And that alone is enough of a reason to say we're not authorized to institute that at the end of davening, we have to, every Jew should start saying Shema Yisrael Hashem Lekein Hashem Lekein. But then Rabbi Yosha says, I have another problem with this suggestion. Dear Kalabar Rebbe, you're suggesting that we say Shema for the following reason that it consists of three words. Lehisyachidim HaKadoshim to unify with the martyrs, to unify with the holy, with the holy um, martyrs, the holy people who gave up their life al Hashem. Says Rabbi Yoshev, Eineni yoidea lozem mekar b'chazal. There's no basis for this in Chazal. What is this concept? To show unity with people who are murdered? Where'd you get that idea from? What, there's a concept? Does it say anywhere in Shas that when someone is murdered al Kedesh Hashem, you should show achtos with him? Is this idea found in a medrash? Is this idea found anywhere in Tanakh? Is it found anywhere in the classic Jewish literature? It's not found anywhere. So you want to institute a new concept. There's no precedent for it. There's no precedent for it. And therefore, says Rabbi Yashav, I think it's a bad idea. It's a bad idea. You cannot institute that everyone should say Shema. And you'll ask, well, you know, if I wanted to say Shema when davening was over, would I be allowed to say Shema? Of course I could say Shema. I could do whatever. I could say Shema. I could say, uh, I could say Ashrei. I could say Lam Natseach. I could say whatever I want. But to legislate that every Jew should say Shema after davening? Why? To show Achtos with the Kedoshim? A beautiful sentiment. A beautiful emotion. Says Rabbi Yashiv. Sentiment is not adequate basis for public policy. That's all. <laughs> so, so therefore, says Rabbi Yashav, my suggestion is continue to do what Klai Yisrael has been do- doing for centuries. You want to remember the Kedoshim, everyone should learn Mishnayis and have in mind that their learning should be Le'iloi Nishmas HaKedoshim. But to invent this concept of to show unity and solidarity with the Kedoshim, we find no basis in Chazal for this. So you'll ask, fine, there's no basis in Chazal. But do Chazal say you're not allowed to? Show me where it says I can't do it. So what do we see from here? We see from here that in order to institute something new, the onus, the burden of proof is on the innovators, not on the status quo. The way Judaism has been is the way it will remain unless you could bring adequate precedent and proof that we should make an innovation. The fact that it doesn't appear anywhere is enough of a reason to say you're not allowed to do it. That's what Rabbi Yashiv is saying. Very clearly. He's telling the Kalva Rebbe that this is a wonderful idea, this is a beautiful thought, this is a wonderful sentiment that you want to show Achtas with the Kedoshim, but it don't say it anywhere. There's no basis for such a thing. You know, there are many contemporary issues. You know, people want to know, where does it say that this type of minion can't be formed? Where does it say that only men can dance with the Sefer Torah? Okay, it may say it actually, but even if it doesn't say it, it doesn't say they're allowed to. So if it doesn't say they're allowed to, they're not allowed to. That's the halacha. That's what Rabbi Yashiv is saying. And look, he's not saying this to, he's saying this to the Kalva Rebbe, a person of great stature. But nevertheless, says Rabbi Yashiv, not only can we not have a fast day on Yom HaShoah, not only should we not have a special day of commemoration, we can't even institute this innocuous practice of saying a Pasuk in Chumash after the davening. Okay, very interesting. Next question. Next question. Listen to this one. Somebody's parents passed away in the Shoah. And there was an empty space in the cemetery. And they wanted to erect a monument in that space in memorial of those who perished in the Shoah. Unfortunately, there's no grave. They don't have any makam uh, kever. There's no kever avos. They want to set up a galed, a matseva, in memorial of those who have perished. Says Rabbi Yashiv. There's halach in your day on sim kufayin chas. In holchem b'chukas ha'amim. You may not mimic the ways of the goyim. Says the Rama. So what does that mean? You know, goyim breathe, right? Goyim have wallets. Goyim have keys to their front door. So that, what is that, you know, so that we have to climb in through the chimney? That certainly you can't do, right? <laughs> right? So, I mean, how are you going to get inside? Through the basement? I mean, goyim, they wear hoisin. 
Actually, they don't, right? So, what, what exactly, what is this principle of Ein Holchem B'chukai Sa'amim? Says the Ramah, there are two types of behavior you're now to mimic. Number one, if it's pritzos. If a guy does something to show promiscuity, out of lewdness, out of impro- indecent behavior, that is the type of behavior you may not mimic. Midai Raisa, B'chukai Sa'amim. Or, if Goyim do something for no reason, right, Goyim said, you can't open up an umbrella indoors. Why not? Why not? What's wrong with opening up? What's going to happen if you open up an umbrella indoors? They have a superstition. So if a Jew says, I don't open up an umbrella indoors, so they're only over in Esr Daraisa. That's it. It's a, it's a lav in the Torah. Or a Jew is about to go to the store and he sees a black cat. Oy! So he turns around. He's over a lav. Because why are Goyim afraid of black cats? There's no reason. It's a superstition. So anything that we mimic from the Goyim, that they don't have a reason, or they don't go under a ladder, well, what's going to happen? So if the ladder is shaky, so don't go under the ladder. But if it's a nice ladder, so walk under. What's the big deal? Okay. However, what if it's something the Goyim do for a logical reason? Let's say Goyim, in memory of someone, they'll have a moment of silence. Now, is that something that's illogical? It's not illogical. It has a certain common sense to it. They pause for a moment and they contemplate, they think about what happened. So for a Jew to participate in a moment of silence, you can't say that would be an Isra Dai Raisa according to the Ramah, because this is not a concept of pritzos. This is not something going to do for no reason. They have, it has a certain logical basis, and therefore a Jew would be permitted to do that. However, the Vilna Goyim disagrees with this. The Vilna Goyim says, anything Goyim do... You may not copy. It doesn't matter if they have a good reason, if they have a bad reason, they have no reason, they have a very logical reason. If Goyim do it, Jews don't do it. That's the opinion of the Vilna Goyim. Okay, doesn't necessarily mean we've, we paskin like this, like this Vilna Goyim. But nevertheless, says Rebbe Yashiv, even according to the Vilna Goyim, you would make the case that then you would not be allowed to have a Matseva memorial in a cemetery. Because who makes memorials? Do Jews make memorials? Goyim are very into memorials. When, when Goyim erect a memorial, so then they, ooh, ah, that's the best thing you could do for the mace, right? You could curse the mace, you could forget about the mace, you could, you know, you could write articles about the mace, slam him, bash him, as long as you erect a stone memorial, that's Kaidesh Kadash. Right? And then you'll take off, you'll whip off the cloth and everyone will be ooing and eyeing. That's the best thing you could do for a mace. So if this is something that Goyim do, says Rebbe Yashif, according to the Gra, we would not be allowed to put up a memorial in honor of the Kedoshim in a cemetery. But then Rebbe Yashif says, come on, memorials are not solely a Goyish thing. Jewish people also make memorials. You look in the Tanakh, there was somebody by the name of Avshalom. Avshalom never had children. So he wanted to memorialize his name. So it says in Shmuel, He vayatsev loy b'chayov es matzevas asher be'emek ha'melech. Yad Avshalom, that you see today, right? You go to Har Azizim, you see Yad Avshalom. That was made by Avshalom. Avshalom was a Jew. So we see that making a matzeva is a Jewish practice. But says Rabbi Yashiv, have a different problem with making the matzeva. And that is, who owns cemeteries? Who owns it? It's public property. It's public property. It's like a Beis HaKnesses. The Shulte Gibayim writes that if Beis HaKfaros has the halachic status of Beis HaKnesses, and the same way a Beis HaKnesses may only be used for its dedicated, devoted purpose, you can't just use a Beis HaKnesses for anything you want. You can't just, you know, open up your shul for a bingo. Because it's owned by the members of the shul for its specific purpose, and that is Tairu Tfila. So a Beis HaKfaros is owned by the public, and it's owned by the public for its specific purpose, and that is burying the dead. So to erect a memorial, a matseva, which is not the intended purpose of a Beis HaKfaros, is stealing from the public. The public owns it for kfura and not for any other purpose. And in fact, says Rebbe Yashiv, that the Chsam Soifer, very much praises this approach of the Shilte Gibayim, that a cemetery is owned by the tzibur, is owned by the public, and it may only be used for its intended purpose. So according to the Shilte Gibayim, one may not set up a matseva and memorial of the Kedoshim. But says Rebbe Yashav, to be honest about this, not everybody agrees with the Shilte Gibayim. 
the Marsham quotes the Magen Avram, and the Magen Avram says, the public doesn't own the cemetery for its intended purpose. It's public property. You could do whatever you want with it, as long as you're not mezalzel with the mason. As long as you don't send your cows in to graze. As long as you don't play punch ball in the cemetery. You could do whatever you want. Says Rabbi Yashabi would come out then, that the permissibility of erecting a monument, a memorial of the Kedoshim in a public cemetery, would be a machloik esachreinim. The Shotei Gibayim and Chabur Chassam Sever would say, you can't do it. And says Rabbi Yashif, the Marsham and the Magen Avram would say, you can do it. So what's the halacha? Says Rabbi Yashif, take a look at the end of the tshuva number two. The Hinei, Af sheyesh makoim lisa v'litein b'nagel adin taira. Even though when it comes to Din Taira, we have what to talk about over here. Is it Mutter? Is it Aser? Ach das Taira. But according to the opinion of the Taira, Ein Ruach Chachamim Noichem The G'day Yisrael don't like this. They don't like it. And if you want to memorialize the Kedoshim, and you want to etern- eternalize their memory, better off doing something that the Chayim get a benefit from. Does any living person get any benefit from some marble structure you put up in the cemetery? Unless it's a hot day and you know that shade it, you know, you could, you could protect yourself in the shade of the monument. But otherwise, what does a living person get from the monument? Says Rabbi Yosha, better to donate a menorah to a shul or the Ner Tamit to the shul. This way you could daven by it, you could learn by it, and you could eternalize, eternalize the memory of the Kedoshim in a way that is according to the tradition of Klal Yisrael. Says Rabbi Yashav, listen to what he's saying. Are you allowed to do it according to the halacha? Maybe yes. That's the din, Taira. But according to Das Taira, you can't do it. What does that mean? What is Das Taira? It appears that what Rabbi Yashav is saying is that according to the letter of the law, there is no inherent prohibition that someone is violating by erecting the monument. But someone who has mastered the entire corpus of halacha, and he's in sync with the value system of the halacha, he is able to have the sensitivities to determine whether this concept fits in with the value system of the corpus of halacha, even though you can't point to any one halacha that says you can't do it. So that's a, also a very important concept. Probably. That means that there may not be any specific halacha in Shulchan Aruch that says you can't do this. Right? Show me where it says you can't do this. It may not say it specifically. But a God of Yisrael is able to determine whether this is in sync with the value system of the Torah or not. Okay? That's the second shuba of Rebel Yashiv. Let's talk about something else quite interesting. Gedoylem books. You want us, uh, Gadol passes away, you want to write a nice storybook about the Gadol, you want to throw in some made up stories, you know? You, you don't know what the Gadol did, it could be he slept 14 hours a night, so you're going to write, this Gadol, I saw the light on in his house all night. Right? You don't know that, he didn't know how to turn off the light. Right? So the light is on, and you're going to write, this Gadol, he learned Tyra 24 hours a day. For his entire life. Are you allowed to make up stories about Gadolim to sort of enhance their, the public opinion of them? Are you allowed to? Says Rebbe Yashif. This gets into a very important question. The question is, at a Leviah, at a eulogy, are you allowed to make up stories about the mace? You know, you want to say, this guy, he was such a big tzaddik. Every morning he got up 4 o'clock in the morning to learn daf yoimi and then omad yoimi. Then he went distributing money to the poor for the next three hours. And then he chazed Yushami. The guy didn't even know Aleph Beis, right? And you read, you made him into the God of Hadar. So the Taz, so the Shulchan Aruch says, the Shulchan Aruch talks about this. Shulchan Aruch says, Maskirin midos tovis, you're allowed to talk about the mace's good qualities. Umaysifin bahem ktsas. You're allowed to exaggerate a little bit. You can't exaggerate a lot. In other words, if the guy knows Aleph Beis, you could say he's learned. If the guy's learned, you could say he's a shtikel tam chacham. If the guy's a shtikel tam chacham, you could say he's a big tam chacham. If he's a big tam chacham, you could say he's a goin. If he's a goin, you could say he's the gadol hadar. Okay? That's what the Taz says. Why? The Taz says, Rav Tam said the logic of that is because probably had circumstances allowed 
he probably would have been a little bit better than he was. A lot better, we can't say. But in other words, you see someone who gives a hundred bucks to tzedakah. Chances are, if he had a little more money, he would have given, you know, a thousand dollars. Maybe he wouldn't have given a million dollars, he would have given a thousand dollars. So you're allowed to exaggerate a little bit. So says Rabbi Yashif, if you're writing uh, Gedolim stories, it's permitted to exaggerate just a little bit. Not a lot, a little bit. Okay. Brings us to a fascinating episode in Jewish history. And this is called the story of the Clevis Get. The Clevis Get. What is the story of the Clevis Get? Well, take a look at number four. Rabbi Yashiv received a letter from the Rosh Hashiva of Yeshivas Devar Yerushalayim. Who is the Rosh Hashiva of Yeshivas Devar Yerushalayim? Rabbi Baruch Horowitz. And Rabbi Baruch Horowitz published a sefer called Mate Levi which are the responsa of his grandfather, Rabbi Marcus Horowitz. Who's Rabbi Marcus Horowitz? Rabbi Marcus Horowitz was the Orthodox rabbi of the Gras Gemeinde. The Gras Gemeinde. The Gras Gemeinde was the larger community, which was a rabbinical board and a Jewish uh, institution with both Orthodox and Reform constituencies. But the majority of the constituencies were Reform. Rav Shamshin Fal Hirsch well, asserted that it was forbidden to be a member of this grass gemeinde. But nevertheless, there were many Gedali Yisrael, and there were straight Jews, kosher Jews, who belonged to the grass gemeinde. Okay. And what happened? Rabbi Marcus Horowitz issued a halachic ruling about a certain issue, which we'll discuss soon. And his grandson republished his chuvas and defended one of the psakim of his grandfather. And not only did he defend the psakim of his grandfather, he published in his halacha sefer all the kol kairis that his grandfather's bezdin issued against other G'day Yisrael of the time. Now, what exactly was this uh, story? In 1766, a great controversy flared up. There was a man by the name of Isaac. Isaac Nieberg. And Isaac Nieberg married Leah. Leah was the daughter of Jacob Gwenshausen. Okay? Jacob Gwenshausen. And they got married. And the Kalo gave the Chassan for the dowry 94 golden crowns. Okay? After the Chassan, the Chassan disappeared. Together with the 94 (laughs) golden crowns. They had no idea where he went. Uh, a few days later, they discovered Isaac in the home of a non-Jew in the village of Fahrenheim. A few days later, Isaac informs his wife's family that this ain't going to work. This is not happening. It's dangerous for me to be here in Germany. I have to escape to England. Okay? But I don't want my wife, Leah, to be stuck as an aguna. So therefore, Isaac agreed to give Leah a get. Fine. And Isaac proceeded to go to England. Adios, amigo. His father learned about the get. His father learned about the divorce. And his father suspected that this whole Misa was contrived by the women, by the, by the ex-wife's family in order to exempt them from giving the 94 golden crowns. So he accused the wife's side of forcing the get. Whereupon the father of the chassan turns to a rub by the name of Reb Tevela Hess, who invalidated the get, passed the get on the grounds that this guy Isaac was a mashugana. He didn't know what he was doing. He did not have his wits about when he gave the get, and he passed the get. But Rabbi, Rabbi Hess did not want to rely on his own psak, so he turns to the bezin of Frankfurt, and to the, the Dionum of Frankfurt, Rav, Rav Naftali Hirsch, Katzen Bogen and Rabbi Eliezer Katzen-Ellenbogen, and Rabbi Yosef Steinhardt. And they agreed with his ruling that Isaac did not know what he was doing, and the get is puzzle. <laughs> Meanwhile, this get was overseen by the Rav of Clevis, and his name was Rabbi Yisrael Lifshitz, who was a big god of Yisrael. And he allowed the get. But the Bezin of Frankfurt puzzled the get. So who did they turn to? They turned to the Gedele Yisrael at the time. Who were the G'dayle Yisrael? Rav Shol of Amsterdam. Jacob Emden. Rav Yaakov Emden. 
Rabbi Chesko Landau. Rabbi of Metz, the Shagas Aryeh. And they all said the Rabbanim of Frankfurt the Main are 1,000% wrong. Based on what are you saying? This Chasan did not have his wits about him. This guy is sharp like a tack. He ran off with the 94 golden crowns and he realizes he's in great financial uh, peril, so he scrammed. The guy is a smart guy. He's too smart. But you're going to say he's a Meshuggah? So therefore, every single God of Yisrael Kemat disagreed with the Dayanim of Frankfurt Domain, and they said they are not authorized to invalidate the get. It's a good get. So you had this tremendous eruption where you had all the G'day Yisrael who happened to come from Poland who interjected themselves in this case, and the, and the Rabbanim of Frankfurt, they said the get is no good. The Rabbanim in Poland said the get is good. What happened? The couple didn't know what to do. Are they married? Are they not married? They got remarried again, but they didn't make a bracha at the chasna in deference to the Rabbanim of Frankfurt. The Rabbanim in Frankfurt were up in arms against the G'daylam in Poland, against the Shagas Aryeh, against the Noida Behuda, against the Yaakov Emden. What are you doing butting into our business? And they published Kol Koyres with terrible criticisms of, against these G'daylam. That's, That's the story. Kol Kari is a, uh, a broadside in English, right? It's uh, you no know, proclamation. And... The G'dayim of uh, Frankfurt to Maine criticized these G'dayim heavily. And meanwhile, this rabbi, living in this generation, decided he's going to write about his grandfather's psaq against all those G'dayim and actually uphold the psaq of his grandfather. So Rabbi Yashiv writes to this rabbi, Rabbi Baruch Horowitz, he said, Shalom Ubracha. I really appreciate the free copy of your Sefer. Thank you very much. The check is in the mail for the uh, copy. And I opened it up, says Rabbi Yashiv, this is number four. And I saw that you're sticking your nose into a great halachic controversy that happened in the year 1766 regarding the get me kliva. And you go so far as to side with your grandfather and the Frankfurt Besden. And you go so far as to paskin against all the glam of the time. Says Rabbi Yashiv, do you know who we're talking about over here? We're talking about Rabbi Cheska Landau? We're talking about Rabbi Yaakov Emden? We're talking about the Shagis Arya, Rabbi Shomi Yazan? For you to stick your little neck into an issue where the giants of the world were involved? Says Rabbi Yashiv, if the Sanhedrin was alive today, and you know who would be on the Sanhedrin? Rabbi Cheska Landau, and the Shagis Arya, and Rabbi Shomi Amsterdam, Rabbi Yaakov Emden, and not one of the Rabbanim of Frankfurt, they wouldn't be on that Besden. And if anyone would disagree with that Bezdin, they would be violating Loisasur Yamin Usma, which means that if Rabbi Yaakov Emden, Rabbi Cheska Landon, Rabbi Shomay Amsim told you that your left hand is your right hand, you say, yeah, 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 yeah. And you don't say, boo. And if you say, boo, well, you're over alive. But even though today we don't have a Sanhedrin, you have to believe that God certainly sided with the majority of the Chachamim of the time. <coughs> And therefore, to, for you to stick your neck into this issue, who do you think you are? And then Rebbe Yashiv says something that really, is, uh, really shook me up. He says, what are you doing publishing the Kol Kaire that those G'daylam issued against the G'daylam Yisrael of Poland? For what purpose? It's criticism against the Baal Markevis HaMishnah? That every single day, the entire Shas was Shogur Bepiv every single day? A god that the Karben Aida said about him that he's an Ish Kadosh. And you're criticizing Rabbi Israel, Mikliva, that the Shagis Aryeh said about him that Klal Yisrael would never be destroyed so long as this man is alive. And the Noi de Behuda said about him that he's a Rav Mephorsam. And you're going to side with the opposition? And you're going to publish the criticism of the Frankfurt Besden? So you say, but you're doing it for the sake of intellectual honesty and historical honesty? There is no concept in Judaism of intellectual honesty and historical a- accuracy. There is no such concept to be historically accurate. At the time, the Rabbanim in Frankfurt, they were heated up 
and they issued very excessive statements. And maybe at that time they said the right thing or they felt they were saying the right thing. But to eternalize their criticism, just for the sake of intellectual honesty, it's a bizayan hataira. There's no purpose in it. There's no, what do you mean? But is it, for the sake of the knowledge of Jewish history, we need to publicize all these controversies. Says Rabbi Yashiv, no, we need to hide them. We need to hide them. You know, people say, it's important to know, not everything is important to know about, not important to know about everything. It's important to know about Mesech the Gittim, and Mesech the Kedushin, and Mesech the Baba Kama, and Mesech the Baba Basra. Not important to know about every single historical eruption. I, but now nobody's ever going to know about the contention that the G'daylam in Poland faced from the G'daylam in Frankfurt. Good, nobody has to know about that. Says Rabbi Yashiv, the G'daylam of Frankfurt in the Oilam IMS, now that they've cooled off, they don't want to hear ever again these words that they said 200 years ago. They don't want anyone drumming up because maybe they didn't do the right thing. And in my opinion, Rabbi Yashiv says, is that your grandfather who paskened against those G'daylam, he wouldn't wanted you, he would not have wanted you to publish all of these statements in your Sefer. So what Rabbi Yashiv is saying is that, you know, our gut reaction is, report the story as is. Don't tamper with it. You know, if you omit certain details, you're tampering with the accuracy of the story. Says Rabbi Yashiv, you bet you are. You bet you're tampering. But there is no redeeming quality that everybody has to know about every criticism that one Gadol said about the other Gadol. You know, throughout history, Gadolim don't always agree. And they may have said very strong things against each other. But a Tamil Chacham who wishes to preserve the history should preserve the Halacha Lamaisa. It's not necessary to preserve all the vicious discussions and accusations and critique that one Gadol may have had for another. <coughs> That's a very big chiddush. That's a novel idea and something to uh, consider. The Rabbi Yashiv is telling us that the dictates of Das Torah govern how we report Jewish history. Let's come back to Rabbi Yashiv and the Kalva Rebbe. Remember the case? The Kalva Rebbe wanted to institute at the end of davening, everyone should say, Shema Yisrael Hashem Lekein Hashem Echad, to be miyached with the Kedoshim. Let's talk about another issue. <coughs> After the Holocaust, many Gedolim, many Rabbanim, were debating, should we compose special kinos in commemoration of the six million? So learning everything about what Rebbe Yashiv holds, how Rebbe Yashiv is really the guardian, you know, the vanguard of the, our tradition, how wary he was about instituting anything new, what do you think Rebbe Yashiv would say about composing new texts in commemoration of the six million? You think he's for it or you think he's against it? Against. You think he's against it, right? For. Absolutely not. <laughs> Rebbe Yashiv was asked in Zion Tammuz Tafshin Mem Hey. Now, the, the, the letter of the Kalva Rebbe was Yud Gimel Sivan Tafshin Mem Hey. This was one month later. One month later, they asked Rebbe Yashiv that. Do you think it's a good idea to enact new texts to commemorate the six million that fell in the Shoah? 1939 to 1945, says Rabbi Yashav. What a wonderful idea. He says, Hine number six. Now this is a letter that appears in the 47th volume of Mevakshe Taira. The 47th volume of Mevakshe Taira. This is from... Tavshin Samaches, right after the Petira of the Myra Shashira Hagoin, Rav Hanach Libowitz, Echitzak Levracha, special commemorative edition for, for Rav Hanach Libowitz and meeting with Rebel Yashiv on the back. And he writes in here, he copies a letter that Rebel Yashiv wrote regarding this kinna. Says Rebel Yashiv, Ein Safe Ki Adavar Nachos. This is very important. The Nachoin Admoid. Says Rebel Yashiv. We always have to follow the earlier generations. And we know in the year Taf Taf Nun Vav, Tatnu, in 1096, in the time of the Crusades, the Rishonim wrote special kinos, remembering those who were murdered in the times of the, of the Crusades. And therefore, says Rebbe Yashav, I personally endorse the special added kinos and commemoration of the Kedoshim. 
But, says Rabbi Yashiv, we will never be able to write one kina that every single shul in Klai Yisrael agrees upon. This shul is going to want to say the kina of the Bav of Arab. And that shul is going to want to say the kina of uh, Rav Schwab. And this shul is going to want to say, by the way, Rav Vazner, the Shevet Alevi, wrote a kina. And that shul wants to say from Rav Michal Ber Weismandel. So therefore, says Rav Yashiv, let every shul say whatever kina resonates with them, is meaningful to them, is significant to them. And this way, on Tisha B'av, everyone will properly commemorate the terrible tragedy of the Kedosh. However, at the Levaya of the Stipler Gain, Rav Shach was fuming. Rav Shach was very angry. Now, if you know Rav Shach, Rav Shach was a Gibor Chayel, a powerful warrior. They once asked, what bracha do you make when you see Rav Shach? So Rav Shom Azam and Orbach said, aside from the bracha of Shecholak Mechachmas Yireyav, you have to make the bracha Shekoychay Ugvurasoy Malay Oilam. Rav Shach. And Rav Shach was fuming that rabbis had the audacity to think they could write their own kinna for the Holocaust. Who do you think you are? What, you're a makubal, you know how every letter affects the shamayim? Says Rav Shach, for someone to tamper with the kinna, it would be like inserting a comic book into the, into the sitter. Who are we to write anything into the sitter? And Rav Shach was so angry, he thought that at the Levaya of the stipler going, that's what he's going to speak about. That the Churban of Klai Yisrael is that rabbis have the audacity to institute a kinna for the Holocaust. But they told him, but Rebbe Yashiv said it's okay. Rebbe Shach says, no, I can't, I can't contain myself. But, Rebbe Shach said, I'm not going to speak at the Levaya. But seven days later, when they had a Yom Azikarain for the stipler after the Avelos, Rebbe Shach got up in Yeshiva Aspanovich and he said that he is compelled to speak Barabim, that there are some Jews, new Vogue Jews, that are making new kinnis. Says Reb Shach, Oi! And then he added for good measure, Oi again! This is a churban for Klal Yisrael. Today they make new kinnis, tomorrow they make new minyanim, and who knows where they go from there. Ay, G'day le Yisrael said it's okay. G'day le Yisrael. What, is this, what does the God al Hadar say? Said Reb Shach, if only the stipler was alive, he would not stand for this. That's what Rav Shach said. So, the grandson of Rabbi Yashiv reports that after a short time, he went to visit Rav Shach. And actually, the grandson of Rabbi Yashiv was sent by Rabbi Yashiv to go to Rav Shach and to show Rav Shach the tshuva Rabbi Yashiv wrote to the Kalva Rebbe. And he said, look, my Zayd the Rebbe Yashiv, he's not a nouveau rabbi. He's not a liberal. He is the vanguard. He is guarding our tradition. He will not stand for even the slightest deviation. He will not even let an Admar like the Kalva Rebbe institute saying Shema Yisrael. So Rebbe Yashiv, they said to Rebbe Shach, would not tolerate even the smallest deviance. So don't think Rebbe Yashiv is allowing this kina because he's being liberal. No, Rebbe Yashiv would not tolerate any deviance. But Rebbe Shach, we want you to know that Rebbe Yashiv has basis for his psaq. What's the basis? You wake up in the morning, what's the first thing you say? Moida'ani. <coughs> Does it say anywhere in Shas you should say Moida'ani? No. Does it say in Shulchan Aruch you should say Moida'ani? How old is the tefillah Moida'ani? It's like about 500 years old. It was composed by Rav Moshe ben Yehuda, Machir, the author of Seder Hayyim, Talmud of the Ariza. And one of the things he tells us is like this. Look at number 8. The Seder Hayyim says that the night of Tisha B'av, after you eat the Sudas HaMavsakas, take off your shoes. Again, this is a, you remember for next year, hopefully we don't have to do next year, but you, you wear your shoes for the Sudas HaMavsakas. During Sudas HaMavsakas, you're not an Avel, you're an Oinein. Anoinein wears his shoes. Okay. And then you go to shul, and then he says something very interesting. I, I don't see people doing this. In the olden shuls, they had a special section for Avelim. Sit with the Avelim. Or change your seat in the shul for Tisha B'av like another. And then sit on the floor and weep and wail 
and cry, cry over the Chorben, cry over the Tamei Chachamim that were murdered. If you know how to wail, wail. If you know how to cry, cry. If you know how to scream, scream. Do whatever you know how to do. And then he says like this, seven lines from the end. Eight lines on the end. If you know how to say kinos, say kinos. Which kinos? Bain ksuvaisa sefer, whether it's kinos that's already recorded, bain me'elav, or kinos that you wrote yourself. According to the wisdom that God has placed in you. Umitzvahi al kol adam. And it is a mitzvah for every Jew. Lechaber kinim. To compose their own kinnis. It is a mitzvah for a Jew to write his own kinnis in the words that he knows how, in a way that's meaningful to him, that he should recite on Tishabav. And will this person be punished for this? No. This will be a righteousness. He will be considered holy. But, says the Seder Yom, if you're not capable of writing your own kinnis, then you'll read kinnis that other people wrote. So the grandson of Rebbe Yashiv goes to Rebbe Shach and says, Rebbe Shach, Rebbe Yashiv would not even allow the Kal of a Rebbe to say Shema Yisrael. But you know why he's allowing these kinnis? Because there's precedent, there's basis. What's the basis? The Seder Yom. You say Maidani every day, or you say, no, Maidani is some kind of new vogue prayer that we don't say. Maidani is, uh, that's... That every Jew says Maidani. Well, the same person who said you say Maidani, he says every single Jew could write their own kinnas, <coughs> should write their own kinnas. That is what the grandson of Rabbi Yashif says to Rabbi Shach. And what did Rabbi Shach say? Okay. He didn't say anything. So, the grandson of Rabbi Yashif heads down the steps. And from the window, someone's knocking on the window. And Rav Shach's grandson is summoning him back to Rav Shach. And Rav Shach says, Yes, the Seder Ayoim says that every single Jew should compose their own tefillah. They should compose their own kinah for them personally. But to legislate that everybody else has to say their kinah, that we're not authorized to do. So the grandson of Rav Yashiv says to Rav Shach, but Rebbe Yashif didn't say that everybody has to say the Bab of a Rebbe's kinna, or Rebbe Chom Ber Vaisandel's kinna, or the Shevet Alevi's kinna. Rebbe Yashif said every shul should say the kinna that's appropriate for them. And what did Rebbe Shach say? I'm asking. I'm asking. So what are we learning from all of this? That the furthest the Gedolim are willing to go to innovate something new, is that on Tisha B'av, we could recite kinnos said by a God of Yisrael, but we can't even say that everybody has to say that kinnos. Every shul should decide on their own which kinnos to say. That is as far as we're allowed to go to innovate in halacha. Beyond that, to say everyone should say Shema Yisrael after davening, can't do that. To say all of Klai Yisrael should make up a new kinna, you can't do that. So imagine if somebody said, you know, why can't, you know, we're going to add a new harachamon to the benching. Harachamon, who yivarech, as, you know, American economy. Right? What's wrong with that? What would be wrong with that? And, and if, even if every God that we saw would be maskam to do that, we couldn't do that. We don't have the authority in our generation to change, to add, to deviate, even one iota. Even to put a matseva in a base hakfaros, and that it says, Remember the six million, Rabbi Yashif says, we don't do that. Das Torah says, it's not within the spirit of the law. And I think the overwhelming message is that we have a certain status quo. That the way things were are the way things they are going to be. And at this point in time, Ad Biyasko El Tzedek, until the great day that El Yohanavi's Mavasa, the Geula, because of our weakness, in, in ruchnius, in spirituality, in Torah knowledge, we are no longer authorized to tamper, to deviate, to touch. You can't even lay your finger on it. All we have is Messiahs, Avoisenu, Biadenu, Abiyaskal, Tzedek, Meher, Amen. Amen. You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.